Robinson Avenue Sunday p.m. worship service. And I just want to thank you for tuning in. Before we get into our worship and our lesson, I want to start us out with a prayer. So if you would just bow with me. God, thank you for everything you do for us, the the immense blessings that you pour out on us each day. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But God, just thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to worship, to be together, to to learn and to be pushed to become better Christians and and more like your son, Jesus. And God, as we consider our finances and our attitudes towards money, God, I pray that our hearts are open, that we listen to what you have to say. And God, thank you for everything you do. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep bay. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's video. I pray that the lesson we get into here in just a second is something that is encouraging and challenging and just pushes you to be a better follower of Christ. So if you remember the last time that, that I was able to speak with you guys, I was in the middle of doing a series on a book called The Good and Beautiful Life, which is based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're still in the middle of that series with the youth group. And so I wanted to share with you guys 
what we covered this last Wednesday with the kids. It was something that was challenging to them, and I think it will be to you too. So buckle up. We're going to go ahead and jump into it here, okay? We're going to start with a study that is cited in the, in the chapter. So we're going to just read the first half of the study right now. It says, Recently, neurologists scanned the brains of a group of believers as they, the believers, thought about times where they had felt close to God. In addition to thinking about God, the same group was exposed to different religious items like stained glass windows, crosses, and even communion. The scientists learned that a specific part of the brain, the caudate nucleus, was activated when the believers thought about God and their religion. And this part of the brain has been referred to as the God spot. So if you ask any member of the youth group what time of the year is their favorite, there's a good shot that they would probably tell you the summer. And the summer is their favorite for a lot of different reasons. They're out of school, they're getting to hang out with friends and do all sorts of fun things. And among those fun things are the trips that we take uh, during the summer as a youth group. We'll go to places like Uplift, Watoga, Green Valley, and Trek. And there's a lot of really cool experiences we have. We go camping, we get to have giant water balloon fights. We get to see people that we rarely see, and that's always a fantastic experience. But usually the number one reason that kids value these trips is for the closeness that they feel to God. They love the worship. They love the lessons they hear. They love the feeling that they get from these trips. And a lot of the time they'll refer to these, these experiences as religious highs. And I have thoughts about religious highs, and, and that can be a conversation for another time. But what this study suggests is that these religious experiences that the kids have at these trips actually have a biological component to it. Their brains are actually, are, are actually responding to the, the worship, to the lessons they hear. The, your brain reacts in different ways to different things and a divine experience experiencing God experiencing these religious things causes a very specific part of your mind to work and that's just something that's real cool we usually think of worship in these religious experiences as something that is out of body very abstract and and not material but what this study suggests is that there actually is a scientific biological component and and I, I think that's something that's really cool. I'm kind of a science nerd, and I, and I just think that's something that's really, really neat. But what is crazy is what the second half of this study found. And so I want to go ahead and read the second half to you guys. So after the scientists, or after this, the scientists brought in a different group, group of people and exposed them to various material possessions and popular brands. And when this group of people saw these items and brands, the exact same part of their brains, the caudate nucleus, was lit up. In this group of people, the God spot was activated by things like cool tech and fancy clothes and fast cars. The scientists learned that people who buy and value certain items have largely the same biological and physiological experience that people do who go through religious experiences. And isn't that, isn't that crazy? Isn't that something that's, that's insane? The, the fact that, that your brain responds in the exact same way to, to God as it does to material possessions. Isn't, that's just crazy to me. There, there's no reason that these things should be even in the remotely same universe. I want to ask, like, can you relate to this feeling, that feeling of, of, purchasing something or wanting something incredibly bad. You're looking forward to getting it, and when you finally get it, you love it, you cherish it, you hold it, you just don't let it out of your sight, and, you, and you're just so excited that you finally have this thing. You, you pursued it, you saved for it, you worked for it, and you finally have it, and you want it even more and more and more. Doesn't that sound a little bit like a religious experience? We, we cherish these times where we feel close to God. We want to have these experiences as much as possible. So what does this mean for us? It means that money and possessions and wealth can become a rival God, a, a idol in our minds, in our hearts. 
And that's something that, that is shocking. Jesus had a few things to say about this in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, and I'll read it to you right now. Matthew 6, verse 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So in this verse, Jesus characterizes a love of money, a love of wealth, as a, as a rival deity, as an idol, as something that stands in direct competition to God. So what is it that God and money are competing for? They're competing for you. They're competing for your heart, for your loyalty, for your admiration. So why is it that, that we value money in the same way that we value God? Maybe it's because we think that we can get from money what we get from God. Think about it. Money can buy you influence, right? Money can, can get you respect. Everybody respects somebody who has a lot of money. What about this? Money can provide happiness. It's always nice to be able to buy something. You get that, that rush of buying something that you've wanted really bad. What about this? Money can provide security. We all worry about our financial security, our financial independence. Those are all things that are filled by God. God is the ultimate source of influence and respect. I mean, the guy runs the universe. How much more influential can you get than God? But money provides a lesser form of it. What about happiness? God is the provider of all the joy in our life. He is the fount of all, all good things. But money can provide a temporary, a temporary happiness. What about security? God is our protector. God cares and takes care of us. He takes care of you. But money can provide a, some level of security. Money can fill that God-shaped hole in your heart, but it's not a good fit at all. Money can become a rival to God if we allow it to take that place in our hearts. I want you guys to be honest with yourselves. Do you allow money to fill that place in your heart? And if you ask me that question, I'd probably say that that's ridiculous. How could how could something like money or happiness or financial security or influence take the place of God in my life? On surface level, that question sounds ridiculous to me. But if I think about it, I do spend a lot of time and energy thinking about the things that I want, the things that I want to achieve. Because I have, I have financial goals down the road. I want to get there. I want to achieve those things. I have things that I work towards right now, things that I want to go buy, toys that I want to get. And I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of money wanting to, to get those things. How much time do I spend working towards my relationship with God? How much of my money do I put towards his kingdom? And when I think about it that way, it really is a much more convicting question. We do spend a lot of time thinking about the material possessions that we have in our lives, the things that we want right here and right now. And even if we don't realize it, a lot of the time they can become a rival God in our lives without us even noticing. And it's something that's very humbling and very challenging. So I want to read a story to you guys. It's a familiar one, but we're going to take a look at it. It's Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verse 18. Luke 18, verse 18. And it says, A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Do not bear false witness. And honor your father and mother. Well, I have kept all of these from my youth. He said, when Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack 
one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then you can come follow me. And after he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. In this story, we can see the conflict and the turmoil and the battle that goes on in the heart of somebody who is at war over whether to be loyal to God or to money. Because in the rich young ruler's life, he says, I've followed all these commands. I've done all these things to demonstrate that I'm loyal to God. And all those things on the surface seem to suggest that. He's lived a relatively good life by these standards, but Jesus recognizes that the inner condition of the rich young ruler, that his heart belongs to his possessions. He is enthralled to the wealth that he has accumulated over his life. And that's what causes him to leave so sad and so upset because his heart has literally just been broken. He's been told, your heart is, is in the wrong place. Rather than belonging to God, your heart is focused on this false idol, this, this wealth that has come to own you rather than you owning it. Jesus told the rich young ruler that in order to inherit eternal life, he had to give away all of his money to the poor. And a lot of the time, Christians will read this story and think that this is a biblical mandate for poverty, that poverty is a requirement of followers of Christ. And I don't think that this is the case. You see, God doesn't want us to live in abject poverty, and he never gave any command that said we should. God wants us to have an adequate amount of material possessions for us and for our families. And this includes a place to live. This includes food and clothes and, and insurance and, and even a vacation every now and then. I don't think God is against vacations. It's okay to have things. But we need to be sure we understand what an adequate amount of material possessions is. You see, at this point, I could try to convince you that Christians shouldn't make over-the-top, gratuitous, lavish purchases, but I don't think that would be a beneficial direction for this conversation to go. I'm not interested in making you feel guilty for going out to a nice dinner once a week or having a really awesome car. We all have different definitions of what adequate means in our life. So I think the best thing that I could do right now is to put the ball in your court, to, to challenge you to be responsible. I challenge you to be intentional with your purchases and how you steward the money that God has blessed you with. So here are a few questions that you can ask yourself before you make a purchase that'll help you know if this purchase is contributing to an adequate or an excessive lifestyle. So here are a couple questions. Do I really need this? Will it bring me lasting joy? not just temporary happiness? Can the money be put to use in a better way elsewhere? And does this contribute to my store of heavenly treasures or earthly treasures? I believe that Paul has a good outlook and a good perspective on wealth and how Christians should view wealth in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I want to emphasize Paul's first sentence here. He says that godliness and contentment bring great gain. You see, the godliness that Paul is talking about has a lot to do with the inward condition of our hearts, like what we were talking about earlier, how money and God compete for your heart. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the inner condition of your heart. Remember, money can be an idol. It can be a rival God that competes for you. Think about the rich young ruler. Part of Part of him genuinely wanted to follow Jesus. He had, he had spent a lot of his life, a lot of his effort following God. But a bigger part of him wanted to, to continue to, to accumulate wealth and, and money. 
ultimately that connection was stronger. You see, Paul says that having a godly attitude towards wealth leads us to contentment in the things that we have, whether they be a little or they be a lot or somewhere in between. It leads to contentment. We're more able to live within the bounds of an adequate lifestyle, and we will find it easier to use our money for God's purposes. We'll find it easier to give to his kingdom and the work that he is trying to do here on earth right now. And all of this leads to great gain because we are actively storing up heavenly treasures rather than earthly ones, treasures that are infinitely more valuable than a, than a cool car or, or something that we can have here on earth. Like I said earlier, this lesson is an incredibly challenging one. It's challenging to me for sure. It is challenging to the kids, and I bet it's probably challenging to you as well. You see, we live in a, in a world, a consumer culture, that praises, that praises the accumulation of wealth and the pursuit of it. The, those are the highest values that there seem to be in the world we currently live in. And it's crazy that those things have become so normal, but they are. And, and for that reason, we don't always realize that, that this is an idea that we have bought into where, where our hearts belong or where our hearts are currently at. We don't always think that our hearts are enthralled to this idea. But I pray that this is something that you can take home with you, that you can work on this week. Uh, see, where, see where your heart truly lies. Is your heart enthralled to possessions, to, to money, to the accumulation of wealth in your life, to the things you want? Or is God the one that is holding on to your heart? Because that's truly the best place that we could possibly be because there's so much more value there than there is over here just with the things that we can accumulate here on the earth because these things aren't going to last. But heavenly treasures with God will. And I pray that that's something you can, you can see in your life this week. And, uh, and I just encourage you to, to continue to work on it as you seek to become a better follower of Christ. And I'll be doing it right along with you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. One step at a time, dear Savior.